Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. My guest today is Professor Wendy Fonarol, who's a professor of anthropology at the Glendale College in California. And uh, she has been studying Halloween for more than 30 years now. So we can definitely call her an expert on this topic. Uh, welcome, Wendy. Thanks for your time. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. Uh, can you explain me, just to start, in a nutshell, what is the story of Halloween? So most of the time when people start with that question, they're hoping for a historic one, but it really is a question about why we do rituals. And so the rituals that we do now have to do with expressing tensions that we have in our contemporary culture. So there are certain irresolvable conflicts that you find in cultures around the world. And one of those are the facts that humans are mortal. And that means in every culture, you have rituals that address the relationship between the living and the dead. So Halloween is the primary holiday to express attitudes towards the dead. Um, and as well, the timing means that it's a Northern European harvest holiday. And I say Northern European because the Northern European calendar, it's at this time of year that you would be basically bringing in the harvest and preparing for winter. So another one of those structural issues that's at stake for Halloween is the um, is basically the period of entering into the season of the earth's decay after harvest, which is one of the reasons why you have like the iconography of the pumpkin. Uh, it's an image of harvest. And those two issues are really there in the colors associated with Halloween, which are orange and black. Orange for harvest, black for death. Um, other issues that are more contemporary would be issues between urban and rural because harvest is so associated with the rural. So all of those together means that Halloween is a contemporary ritual that we get to express attitudes about the relationship between the living and the dead. Um, harvest season in the US, that means like it's pumpkin spice latte season. Um, and then also issues about being an industrial society and what that means in relationship to harvest. The term itself, Halloween, is a is basically the like Scottish version of All Hallows Eve, which means the evening before All Hallows. And that's um, basically the evening before All Saints Day. And that's why it's got its name. So is that a good enough nutshell? Oh, yes, it is. It was very good. You already mentioned uh, something about pumpkins, but uh, I would like to ask you, where does the jack-o'-lantern come from? So the jack-o'-lantern initially comes from Irish lore, uh, and there's the story of Stingy Jack. Basically, there's an altercation with the devil. The devil wants to take him. Stingy Jack figures out various ways to thwart the devil. And so the devil makes a deal with stingy Jack saying, I will never take you. You won't ever go to hell. Um, and so when stingy Jack dies, uh, he can't go to heaven and he can't go to hell. And it's thought that, that the devil then threw one of the embers from hell that then stingy Jack basically wanders the landscape. Now, this is the same origin of the Will of the Wisp, but one of the things I think is most interesting is that the original jack-o'-lanterns, obviously that context was Ireland. Um, those early jack-o'-lanterns were for um, turnips and beets because squash are a new world, pumpkins are new world. So their original ones were much smaller, but also it had to do with the fact that when you're talking about rural areas, pre-electricity, if you're out at night, you need to have some sort of way of lighting your way. So the jack-o'-lantern was a way that you could move from your house to other houses or get to town. And you would have on the special night of Halloween, you would be bringing a jack-o'-lantern with you. So. Okay. Talking about another thing we do on Halloween, where does the trick or treat come from? 
So trick-or-treating is really complex. And that was looking at trick-or-treating was really the beginning of me studying Halloween. Um, I was looking at contemporary trick-or-treating practices where it's children going door to door. And so I looked at a number of the historic precursors and what you find in Northern Europe, there are a number of different activities that are based on going door to door and asking for something from home, homeowners or householders. Uh, that would be possibly asking for donations for the village fete. It could possibly be um, saying that we will pray for your dead relatives. Uh, so it meant that, that like in, um, in Scotland, it was called um, guising. Um, in other areas, it was called mumming. And actually, there are still regions where people will do this going door to door as mummers or mumming. And, and if you look at like early newspaper, newspaper accounts in the U.S., it's actually called um, mumming. Uh, the, the term trick or treat actually doesn't even enter into uh, popular usage at all until the 1920s. But to sort of bring it back to before we get to the 1920s, um, initially the people who were going door to door were adults. So they were adults going door to door asking for things. But because Halloween was the new year, so for the Northern European calendar, the, the time that you would mark between the previous year and the new year would be Halloween. And so because it was the time between times, something like liminal time, it was thought that all sorts of supernatural entities could sort of take advantage of that time to get up to no good. So if those entities were about and you were outside, you'd want to disguise yourself. So people would go to other people's houses in disguise, basically demanding treats or offerings. And if they didn't get what they want, it could be a sort of hostile situation. It doesn't turn into a children's activity until the 20th century. Um, and it actually moves out of initially where kids primarily didn't go trick-or-treating, they mainly ran around doing petty to fairly elaborate pranks on, on Halloween. So I, interestingly, what, for the earliest trick-or-treat, um, as of right now, uh, while most people attribute it to the United States in like the mid-1930s, I have found accounts in Alberta, Canada of the phrase trick or treat um, being used in like 1927. And then there's an early one that it doesn't say trick or treat, but it says tricks and treats in um, 1922. So, so it looks like trick or treating might've started in Canada rather than the United States. But um, I'm looking into that at the moment. That's surprising. That's surprising and unexpected to me at least. I came to the States a few years ago in October, and I had the impression that Halloween is something more seasonal rather than a single day because it's celebrated in the whole month of October. Like I saw people uh, having decorations, and I also talked to people who told me, oh, we just had uh, our Halloween party yesterday, which was mid-October. Was my impression correct? Yes. It, it's, this is something that's really happened within the period of time that I've been studying Halloween. 30 years ago, Halloween was not a month long, month long celebration process. And for a lot of people, Halloween now is two months. Like the Halloween begins when the stores start having their pumpkin spice coffee options. Uh, but it's for many people, it's September 1st is when you go into the season of iconography of harvest. And since there's so many different environments, it really is this iconography of the pumpkin and the smell of the pumpkin and getting to see decorations that says we are entering into fall. Because like in Southern California, it's still sunny here. It looks like summer. So it's these images that make us think it's the season. Um, there are a number of factors that 
had Halloween expand. But one of the things that I think is really nice is that while one of the adjacent holidays that is being really embraced in the United States, Dias de los Muertos, originally that was a celebration for the dead that was two months long. So in some ways what America is doing now actually dovetails with the indigenous populations of Central America's way of celebrating uh, their dead. What is the most common way to celebrate Halloween, for instance, where you live? Do you guys go outside celebrating uh, outdoor or is it out, house parties? So for Halloween, the doorway, that idea of between inside and outside is a central area for Halloween. Although you have activities that are in the house, you have activities that are in public, and that trick-or-treating happens at the doorway. So in the same way I was saying the relationship of the living and the dead and the idea of order and chaos, the doorway is also inside and outside, where the outside is presented as chaos on Halloween, and that means the inside is supposed to be more orderly. Um, it turns out that the biggest factor in how you celebrate Halloween is age related. So you do different activities depending on your age. And there also is an issue between like urban and rural celebrations. So if you're young, um, like basically infant to childhood, Halloween tends to be focused on trick-or-treating, at least on that day. The expansion of Halloween activities means that you can do other activities. Then for adolescents, the main things you do on Halloween would have to do with things that are about being scary. So watching horror films or going to the amusement parks that are scare theme parks. So in California, that would be things like Not Scary Farm or... Um, universal Halloween horror nights. And that ends up being sort of like a festival of screams. Then for young adults, you have much more public parties. So either parties with, that are at someone's house or the big parades that you would find someplace like West Hollywood or in Greenwich Village in, in New York, where people are in costumes. Those costumes tend to be like highly sexualized. And so part of that is the indulgence of candy in childhood starts getting translated into the indulgence of, of alcohol in um, young adulthood. And then once people actually have kids, their role on Halloween is basically having their children do the trick-or-treating activities. Again, because Halloween is so long, everybody can watch scary movies and you can go to houses that are really decorated. Like I've spent the entire month, every weekend, hunting for home haunts. And that's people who hyper decorate their houses in ways that are very close to what Disneyland would do. Uh, and that is absolutely phenomenal. And that's a way that I'm sell I get to celebrate Halloween and research Halloween for basically a six week period. It used to be just five days. <laughs> okay. Uh, you already said something about it, but I would like you to elaborate on the differences between Halloween in big cities and Halloween in the countryside. Because uh, in my fall vacation to, to the States, I mentioned before, I was in New York, so a very big city. Uh, but I think that if instead of New York, uh, I went to the Pennsylvania countryside or another place, Halloween would have been completely different. Would you like to explain us what would have been like in the countryside? So in the countryside, there is actually a sort of small, similar dynamic with the larger cities. Um, one of them has to do with, for something like trick-or-treating, you want houses to be pretty close together in order to efficiently get candy for children. So in smaller cities, what they tend to do is not have trick-or-treating happen so much in like neighborhoods where houses are very far apart people will tend to come together like in a main square where you'll have businesses being the part of the householder and then 
children being the ones who go door to door. So the, it will happen in the city center and you'll get more than a sort of multi-age parade circumstance going on. In other areas, they might not do it in the city center, but they do something called trunk or treat so that a bunch of people go to a parking lot, they decorate their cars or their trucks, and then children get to go from car to car doing the trick-or-treating ritual, which is basically say trick-or-treat and in exchange, you get some candy. Um, so what you're finding in those areas that if you don't have enough density, people will come together. Uh, even in urban areas, like where you get your pumpkins, people like going to pumpkin patches, which is a way of setting up a um, rural scenario in the city. So if you're in a rural area, you usually can go to a farm to do things like get your pumpkin or maybe pick some apples. Uh, so in those rural areas, people find ways of coming together so they're in high density for for Halloween. And in the big cities, you used to not have to come together so much, but because in the in the late 19th 1980s and early 90s, there was a an urban legend about the myth of the Halloween sadist. This was an urban legend that people were putting drugs in candies and razor blades and apples. It never happened, but it changed the way people celebrated Halloween. So a lot of people started going to shopping malls, but that didn't really have a lot of great atmosphere. So when the urban legend started waning and people started wanting to go back to their neighborhoods. They found that a lot of those adults who used to have trick or treating on offer were doing other things like going to parties, finding other ways of celebrating Halloween. And so now what happens in big cities is you need to find a hot spot, which is not that different than going to a town square. So a hot spot would be a neighborhood that has lots of decorations that's fairly flat and at least one person who has gone really out of their way to make their house amazing and that can create a hot spot where in a big city a bunch of a bunch of people from throughout the city will go to that location so it isn't just neighbor to neighbor which was more characteristic of like the late 1980s and 90s before this urban legend I've heard this urban legend as well around the year 2000. Indeed, I haven't heard it in recent years. I think there's a common misconception here in Italy, according to which Halloween is somehow anti-Christian or anti-religion in general, celebrating evil and darkness instead of celebrating the light. And someone even says that it overlaps with a Christian uh, holiday and shadowing it. I mean, last time I came to America, uh, I saw absolutely nothing evil or celebrating evil in Halloween. So can we rule out once and for all that Halloween is anti-Christian somehow? Well, it's, I, I, we can because if, if Halloween is anti-Christian, so is Christmas and so is Easter. Um, it isn't, the, the way of shadowing actually was not that, uh, that these holidays were shadowing the church. The church very savvily mirrored or shadowed these holidays. I mean, if you look at historic records in terms of when Christ was born, all evidence points to the summertime. Right. But there was, yeah, there was, so there is, it was a strategic, a really brilliant um, strategy of, instead of, in, in order to uh, basically Christianize uh, initially Southern Europe and then later Northern Europe, um, the church decided um, a strategy of co-optation. So instead of outlawing uh, rituals, which by the way, incredibly smart because rituals are doing these very important things. They're not relics from the past. They're addressing important issues within a culture. So instead of outlawing them, they were reframed as being Christian. So the winter solstice was dubbed for Christ's birthday. Um, uh, in springtime, 
the spring uh, planting that was that was put as the resurrection. So this was this very, very strategic co-opting of what would be pre-Christian pagan customs. The original All Saints Day was in springtime because that was the Southern European festival of the dead. And in Northern Europe, they were celebrating their festival of the dead at the time of harvest. So about 230 years later, they changed the date of the All Saints Day. And it was basically saying, you're not celebrating your dead. You're actually celebrating the hallowed dead. So it was strategically placed in order to co-opt these pre-Christian customs. And this, by the way, is one of the things that led to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, I know that most of the time people look at things like bureaucracy, um, a need to translate into like vernacular languages so you could understand what was being said in the Bible. But there was also a grievance that, that the church itself was too pagan. So Protestants wanted to get rid of all of these celebrations, which, I mean, depending on the denomination of Protestantism, uh, many of these holidays, including um, Christmas, were no longer celebrated. So Halloween is no more evil or pagan than any of the others. What I would say is that the issues that are dealt with, the fact that it's dealing with the dead, and there's a lot of fear around the dead, uh, and that's part of why so much of the imagery around it um, is scary imagery. It's it's not an anti-Christian. It's I mean, it's called All Hallows Eve. So it's in the name. It's acknowledging that. So, it, but it's not something even being told that it's not going to go away because there is going to be Protestant resistance because all of these celebrations are have pre-Christian marking in terms of what we're doing. Even in this modern form, you have these elements that date back to uh, the pagan pre-Christian era. Um, but we can keep saying there's nothing wrong with, with celebrating the dead and representing the dead as being scary. There are other places where the dead are not scary. The dead are represented as allies. And that would be like Dias de los Muertos. The dead are are your allies. They're your ancestors and your, you know. I, I would add that people who think that Halloween is evil uh, have only seen Halloween in horror movies. So they think it's just about serial murderers and have never probably been to the United States during the fall season. And the, the thing about those serial murderers is that they're representing chaos as opposed to order. So it's all about inverting what is ordinary behavior. So if you're dealing with death, then of course, what could be more inappropriate than someone who is causing death? And depending on like, it's interesting, like Freddy Krueger as a horror figure, because initially he was killed because he killed children. That lets you know one of the structural issues is the one that goes down at the doorway between adults and children and unexpressed hostility in that relationship that symbolically gets expressed on that hot, on that celebration. So that you get the symbolic expression of all sorts of taboo sentiments on all sorts of rituals. So. I would like to ask you something else. Uh, Halloween has been celebrated here in Italy for like 20 years now. It was, like in the 90s, it was something we only saw on TV. So I was wondering, uh, was it celebrated even before year 2000 in other English speaking countries, such as UK, Ireland, Australia, Jamaica, as far as you know? So this is, this is really important. Uh, Halloween was initially not celebrated in the US um, because if you noticed, I've talked about the theme between Protestant and uh, Catholic. In the UK, where you had um, the celebrations of All Hallows Eve, when the Protestant Reformation went down, this meant the Protestants did not want Halloween celebrated, but the Catholics did. 
And what you get is um, with Guy Fox Day, which is November 5th, um, basically the pivot of a religious holiday into a secular political holiday, uh, which was, by the way, blatantly anti-Catholic. So bonfire night, they burn effigies of the Pope, they burn effigies of the guy who was involved in the gunpowder plot. But it also means that in the United States, initially the celebration at autumn was Pope's Day. And that happened until um, the um, uh, Revolutionary War because the American allies were French. So the last thing you wanna do is be burning effigies of the Pope. So you actually have a long time before Halloween really gets embraced in the United States. And uh, there are various historians who have different takes of when that began, but it means that in many British colonies, Halloween was not celebrated. Um, interestingly, like in South Africa, uh, in some parts of Canada, Australia, in the UK, the main celebration was Guy Fawkes Day, not Halloween. And it really is in the last 20 years that Halloween has been exported back to areas where um, it either was never before or had been replaced by a different holiday. I do have a theory about why that is. It seems to go hand in hand with the Simpsons. So I actually oh. think that Sim the Simpsons, the, that, that cartoon that is so easy to translate, that so celebrates Halloween, that that has been a primary exporter. Uh, interestingly, um, when I went to uh, Mexico to look at Day of the Dead, I have found that there is some there is some Halloween being celebrated in Mexico now, as well as Day of the Dead being widely celebrated in the United States. So those holidays are are feeding each other. But um, Guy Fox is actually in in primarily Protestant. English post-colonial countries, Guy Fawkes is more common than Halloween up until this recent generation where uh, America's export of its own culture meant that this holiday is celebrated not just in English speaking countries, but also like in Japan, so. Italy. And Italy, yes. Italy. Many thanks for your time, Wendy, for your very precise uh, explanations. I hope that your words will help people celebrate Halloween in a more conscious way and best way possible. Many thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for watching and see you all next time.